may take time, right? Is anybody done yet? I'm not done yet. It, it, but willingness. And if, and if you look at this and go, God, I'm, I'm willing to practice these things. Help me. Help me to keep you at the center. Help me to cultivate every opportunity with prayer. So <clears throat> this last week, I had, a, I had an opportunity to practice this core value. So, and I, 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 I never want this to come across as a downer. I've told this story a couple of times, and I give Kelly a bad time because she, she got me. So I, I uh, she called me up, and, and actually, I called. I'm like, hey, I talked to Jeremy, and I'm like, do you guys need any help on Saturday? Like, with the kids' games or anything? And he's like, yeah, dude, you're running a game. I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. I... Uh, okay, well, you know, I was thinking, I asked, so I, I showed up, and so I talked to Kelly, and she goes, hey, could you meet me on Monday in Martin City to meet with Philly Steve, because he's, like, going to show us how things are set up. I'm like, yeah, sure, I can do that, you know, give me a time. So I show up, and uh, Philly Steve and is there, and I've never met him, and Kelly's there, and we're standing in the middle of Sugar Hill, there, and Martin City, and, and Steve starts talking about sled races. I'm like, sled races? I'm running a game where we're shooting this plastic deer. What are we talking about? And so he gets partway through this, and he stops, and he looks at me. and goes, so what do you think? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know I was doing sled races. So anyway, we got to the end, and everybody left, and I said, well... It, it looks like I just inherited a sled race. And, of course, I knew I wasn't by myself. But for me, okay, you got to understand, and I, so I, I see this as a God opportunity. For me, I'm like, oh, I'm not a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants guy. I'm just not. I'm like, I need things to be in line, to be organized. And looking at this, but in the moment, I stopped, right? I like it when God gets our attention. And, and he's just like, Brent, is this an opportunity to create healthy community in your community? Yes, it is. Is this an opportunity to create a greater capacity for God? Yes, it is. Then this is missional. This is on mission. This is an opportunity. And what opportunities might you take if you weren't afraid of failure? Ooh, God, you're asking for some willingness. You're asking for some willingness. And so I grabbed this core value and I said, okay, God, I'm going to cultivate every opportunity with prayer. God, this is your opportunity, and you are already doing something, and you are just asking me to be willing to put a foot out there and just stand on the piece of land that you've given us. All right? And so we had this other, and, and the funny thing was, you know, when you're not good at something, you need to surround yourself with people that are good at that thing. So I'm not good at, like, fly by the seat of my pants. So the first thing I did was call one of my neighbors that I knew was good at flying by the seat of their pants. <laughs> I said, would you help me? Would you come and, oh, yeah, I'd love to come and help. And then, and, and, and there, was, there was a lot of the Jim was there, and Kelly was there, and Bobby was there, and Jordan Rakowski was there, and Jeremy was there, and it, it just orchestrated, and it came together, and I began to pray. I said, God, would you help me? Right? What did David say? Restore to me the joy. And, and joy is the look in somebody's face that says, I'm glad to be here with you, God. I said, God, I want to go enjoy this. I want to go enjoy this. You haven't given me a spirit of fear, a spirit of power and love and, and sound mind. And, and so this core value, like I went back to this this week. I said, God, like this is it. Cultivate every opportunity. It's not about the doing because prayer gives everything potency and effectiveness, no matter how small it is. So I said, God, I know if you've asked us to step out, that you're going to meet us and you're doing something. And this is very on mission, right? It does exactly what we say we want to do. And so help me to trust you. Help me to trust you in that. And uh, I'll challenge you. I, mean, I hope this sticks in your head. What opportunities might you say yes to if you weren't afraid of failure? Right? I was thinking of you when 
So that's for you. What opportunities would you say yes to if you weren't afraid of failure? That's a God thing. I specifically thought of him this morning, so I'm not putting him on the spot to put him on the spot, but you just need to know that. What opportunities would we say yes to if we weren't afraid of failure? Because I, I believe in your homes, in your job places, in your community here in the church, there are going to be opportunities to go, <gasps> right? But if you will stop and you will listen and go, God, is this your opportunity? And, and do I understand you want to lead me in this? So it's not about me performing things perfectly. It's just saying yes and going, okay, sustain me with a willing heart. And then going back to something like these core values and going, okay, if I'm going to, if I'm going to step out in this, then prayer needs to be at the core of what I do. The next one, um, and, and then I, I put that prayer gives our doing potent substance and effectiveness. That's what prayer does. Small things have great power when prayer is at the core. So, what opportunities are before you this week that you can begin with prayer? And just keep it simple and remember the mission. God would lead and empower you just to create a greater capacity for God in this community and in this opportunity. God, please empower us to create healthy community in our community and in our doing. So, there, that one, it, it just, uh, right? I, I, I like tools, right? I've always liked tools. I got that probably from my grandpa. And, uh, but, you know, a tool that doesn't get used is a waste of money. <laughs> waste of time. So, let's use these tools. Let's, let's take them out. So, second core value. Second one on the list is value each person. Um, that is just something that as we look at our church, we really, we saw that there. We didn't, we didn't say it was perfected. But it, it was something, it was a strength in the church that as we look for the, at least as long as I've been here, I could be wrong. You could probably give me examples. But for the most part, as a pastor, looking over the general operation of the church, like when you walk in the door, you don't have to look like something or have something to be valued. You value, value each person. Here's what we put as a, just a little statement that goes with that. It says, looking for and affirming God's value in each person. So this is a core value. This is a core value. If, if we're going to step out in the opportunities that God gives us, this is one of the things that we begin with prayer. But as you enter into any activity, isn't it funny, most activities include people? And I, 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 like I said, I'll tell you my weaknesses. My weaknesses is I like, I'm an organizer. I like to have things organized. And sometimes the organization means more to me than the people that show up. And so I lose sight of the value in the people and what's happening and get tied up in the, in the structure and the mechanics of how this is going to happen. And so this brings me back to go, all right, I'm going to start with prayer. But I have to understand that this is for people. And that was yesterday. I, I shared another story with somebody this morning. I said, it's so unlike me. God must have really have done something because I, I just, I like rules, okay? Okay, the rules are there for everybody. They keep things in order, right? They help things move. They keep it clean. I like the rules. The rules make it fair for everybody, right? And so our registration was supposed to end at 11.45 for these races. And, of course, you know, people showed up after 11.45. And we, we did keep registering, but we ran out of numbers. We had so many kids, and so we kind of had to stop, and so there were some people who showed up late, and they didn't get a number and couldn't get their kids in, and they weren't happy at the bottom of the hill, so they came up the top of the hill, and I'm just up there trying to get chaos to move, right? It's just a zoo, and Philly Steve, he's announcing, and I'm trying to shove kids out on the snow, and this lady grabs me, hey, hey, can't you let a couple of local kids in without a number? 
And, and it was funny because I didn't even stop, right? Normally, that would have just, like, you just, you just put a steel bar in the gears of structure. <laughs> and and I, I just stopped. I looked at the lady, and I recognized this meant something to her. And I said, yeah, just hang around. I'm sure we can get them in. Ah, it's kind of a big deal for me. But you know what? I had to value her more than I did, the, even though I still believe in the rules, even though I still believe in the structure, that flexibility. But to look and to go, man, this, this is somebody, maybe this was going to be the highlight of their whole time here. And it's within my power, right, to help them. And so I'm going to. I'm going to. It, it was part of valuing the person part of valuing the person. And I, I have just found that when I am willing to walk in that, there have been some hard situations that have been much easier because rather than trying to fix the situation, I was given the opportunity to value the person. Now, Paul tells us, he goes, you got to be careful. He goes, when you're helping somebody that's struggling, don't get drugged down into what they're in. He goes, that that, that, that is a caution. But it is so important that I value people, that I value people. And so our flagship verse that we chose for this core value was Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And Titus says this, or Paul says this to Titus. He says, but when the kindness of our God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regenerating and renewing by the Holy Spirit. I could go a lot of different directions with this because there's so many facets to this diamond, right? You know, that's the little cuts on a diamond. Each one's called a facet, many faceted uh I can't remember if it's Galatians or Ephesians where it talks about the multifaceted um, dynamic of God. There's a lot of facets to valuing people. But my greatest appreciation of this core value is that it requires each of us to depend on the Holy Spirit in new ways each day. Anything that helps us grow in spirit dependence is a good thing. I would say that if you went to Galatians chapter 5 and you look at the fruit of the Spirit, right, which you cannot have without a dependence on the Holy Spirit, right, and you get to the end of those, and what does it say? Against such things, there is no law. Like, you can do these any time and not be wrong. <laughs> Anything that causes us to depend on the Holy Spirit in a greater way is a good thing. And so that is probably my greatest, is that when I go, I'm, I, wanna, I want to affirm God's value in each person. Boy, it's going to take a different set of eyes than the ones I got poking out the front of my head. I'm going to have to lean on the Holy Spirit and go, Holy Spirit, what are you doing and who is this? If you look at the statement that the Acts 2 team penned, looking for and affirming God's value in each person, and I, I just kind of said that if I'm going to look for God's value in each person, it's going to take more seeing power than my natural eyes can provide. Sin has a way of covering up our God-given value and purpose. Isn't that true? Every person is created in the image of God. Sin distorts the image. And boy, sometimes it's hard to see through it. Sometimes it's hard to see through it. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which... Eye has not seen and ear has not heard and that have not entered the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. 
a couple of interesting observations from this that draw into this. Um, one, at the end, we see that it's dependence upon the spirit that allows the seeing, the hearing, and the understanding to come into the heart, right? It's, it's not natural comprehension. But one very interesting thing is that think about Jesus, okay, because this passage of Scripture has to do with Jesus. Very few people could see God's value in Jesus. And this passage highlights the fact that the smartest ones were the most blind to God's purpose and value in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? For if they had understood, they would not have crucified. Well, I'll tell you what, don't get too confident in what you think you know about people because you go, oh, if Jesus was here, oh, you probably wouldn't even have known who he was because most people did not. And if they thought they knew, they had a different picture of what he was than who he really was. They really didn't understand. Who understood who Jesus was? Barely, the disciples. And when Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Peter answers, and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. What does he tell him? He said, you didn't get that by human instinct. My father who is in heaven revealed that to you. And so there's, there is a, a serious, if we're going to see the value, right? People couldn't see the value in Jesus. So how much more difficult might it be to see the value in my neighbor sometimes? But yet they are created in the image of God. And it says the Holy Spirit searches the things of God, even the deep things. And sometimes it's only going to be God who knows what he's doing and what he created this person for. And when I say God help me to value and to see your value, right? Now I have become reliant on the Holy Spirit, but now I'm praying a prayer. Now I'm asking for something that's close to the heart of God. Help me see the value in your creation. Um, that's a hard prayer to pray. Sometimes, a lot of times. But most people couldn't see the value of Christ. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Uh, the second thing that, that I kind of came away from that verse with is that God's plans and value will not immediately be seen or understood through natural means, but only by the Holy Spirit who searches and knows the deep, intimate thoughts of God. If we are to look for and affirm God's value in each person, we must be asking the Holy Spirit to give us that insight. Um, and, and again, you know, what, what I prayed through the week or what I came back to, and, and I kind of picked this up a few years ago, is that most times, most times, there is one person that God is going to make a connection with, right? And, and that's the one person where I need to be paying attention because that's the place where God will give me the insight, right? And I get to speak to that value and it's interesting, when you speak to something that is naturally there, the other person recognizes it, right? It clicks with them because God's already been working on it, right? And you, you recognize and you draw that value out. And can I tell you, everybody sitting here wants to be valued. We, we are created, right, with a desire to be valued. That's why you see people doing some of the crazy things they do. Like, I watched a guy walking around yesterday in his pajamas, outside, barely dressed. <laughs> I won't tell you what went through my head, but he, he just was screaming for attention. Like, I want to be valued. I want somebody to see me. I want somebody to see me. I want somebody to care that I'm here. We all have that. But when we don't do it just on external means and what we see, we tend to value things that we like. We tend to speak to things that we see that we like. Um, we tend to lead with things that we don't like when we're dealing some situations rather than stopping and going, God, help me to see the value in this person that you see so that I can speak to that by your Holy Spirit so that your spirit is leading my conversation and my acting and my listening because I understand you value them. 
I'm struggling with valuing you. Okay, don't be a fraud. Man, God, I don't like that person. I don't like what they do. I don't like how they act. I don't like what they create. But if this is your opportunity, then I'll move towards it. I'm pretty sure it's in my notes someplace and I skipped it. Isn't it funny that so many of God's opportunities come dressed like a Goliath? That was one of the greatest opportunities for the nation of Israel. But everybody was afraid of failure. So here comes a David. Here comes a David. And uh, there's going to be opportunities that God opens up and they look like a Goliath. But we've got some great tools to go, okay, God, you've lined me up. Here's where I start. I'm going to start with prayer. And uh, I have a very difficult person. God, would you help me to see your value in them? I am willing to be led by the Spirit. And those who are led by the Spirit will be called the children of God. That's what it says. All right. So, um, even though it's not written in the statement, this core value keeps God in the center of what we do because it's, it's, a, it's a reliance on the Holy Spirit. It's not about how smart you are or how well you can read people. It's a dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And so I put here just a, a prayer, right? God, please empower us to see your value in people that you place around us in community. And help us to communicate your value in ways that build up and move people towards you. Right? Because that's what, um, I mean, I just, I just, do you ever struggle with praying for somebody? Oh, man. I mean, there's people I go, God, I don't want to pray for them. I don't like them. I don't like what they do. And God goes, yeah, but if I got a hold of their heart, you think they might change? Yeah, I was, I was across the road one day praying, complaining. I was complaining to God. I was prayer complaining about some things I saw that I just didn't like. I'm like, God, you need to fix this. You need to do this. I may have told this before, but. And God said, well, why don't you pray that, that they would realize my mercy? And I'm like, <laughs> Mercy for them? They don't need mercy, right? Maybe a game of mercy would be nice. And God goes, well, he goes, wait a minute. So mercy is a unique attribute in that it can only be given to guilty people. Mercy can't be given to an innocent person. It has to be given to a guilty person. So for them to recognize the mercy, which is what God was asking me to pray, they would have to recognize that they were guilty. And they would have to ask for forgiveness. And then they would be turned towards God, moving in a direction that I would like to see them to go. And God goes, why don't you pray that? Like, because blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, because you still need my mercy. And when you recognize my mercy towards you in the things that you do wrong, you wholeheartedly repent. And Pray for a willing spirit to change. He goes, pray that. Pray that because that's the value I see in them. That's the reason I sent my son to die was so that people could recognize my mercy and turn to me and come to me. Seeing the value in each person. Keeps God in the center. Keeps God in the center. Uh, the second reason that this tenant of valuing each person is such a powerful core value is because it defines and reminds us of where each person's value comes from. True value is derived from the source of our existence rather than what we produce. Um, isn't it funny? We, we do naturally tend to value people based on what they do. It's what gives them value, right? I mean, that's just, that's just, 
I can walk into a mall and grade people from 1 to 10. I just can't. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying it comes pretty easy. And so this valuing each person causes us to reconcile the fact that value doesn't come from what they do. It comes from the source of their creation. If I handed you two watches that looked identical and I asked you to tell me which one was more valuable, what would you look for? I'd look for a maker, right? That's the first thing I would do is I would start twisting around seeing who made these things because it doesn't matter what they look like on the outside. It's who the source of the watch is. And so I find out that one's a Casio and one's a Rolex. Which one is more valuable? The Rolex. Okay, so what if the Casio was brand new and the Rolex was old not quite functioning right and had a few dents and dings on it. Which one's more valuable? The Rolex. So it's not a function of whether or not it works right. It's a function of who made it. That's where you get your value. And so sometimes we meet people and they're not quite functioning right and they're a little rough around the edges. And I got to go, God, help me to see you in them. Help me to see you in them. Help me to see what you created. God, you had, per- I don't care if they were unplanned. I don't care if their parents didn't love them. I don't care what has happened. God, they did not come to this earth without your foreknowledge and your word says you knew every day of their existence yet before there was one. And great are your thoughts towards them. Now, not everybody responds to that. I cannot make them respond, but it does not take away from the value that they have because of whose they are. Tough to see, though. Tough to see. But if I'll go back to the core value and I'll say, God, help me to see your value in people, I truly believe that the Holy Spirit will give us eyes to see things that when given words build up, and draw towards Christ, right? And maybe it gives me the courage to keep going, right? Or um, gives me the courage to speak to what needs to be spoken to so we can move a certain direction. I, I'm, I'm not a, f- a, a huge fan of, of trying to manipulate people and change them, and there's a time that you have to release people and you have to let them go because they're going to have what they want, but that doesn't change the fact that I can ask God, God, help me to see the value because that's what we move towards in the relationship. And that weeds out a lot of other things, right? And if there's not a responsiveness, I can step back and go, well, I still see your value, but we're just not on the same page right now, but I just want you to know I care about you and I believe in you, right? I can do that. I can do that. What what happens? I've left a bridge of value, right? And I guarantee you, if people are genuinely valued, they'll come back. (laughs) They'll come back. Um, So, uh, yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna close up with this. So it's kind of a it's a true story about this. Kind of a a funny story again. God speaks to me in my whining. Once upon a time, I had a neighbor, and it's not Jade, (laughs) but he lived in Jade's lot, and uh, methamphetamine addict, and uh, this guy, squirrely, oh my goodness, up until all hours of the night, tearing cars apart making racket, and uh, he found himself embroiled in some things that made the newspaper. But he liked me. He liked our family. And every time you would go out, I would kind of look sometimes to see if he was outside his little tent, just because I knew that he would, like, just come over and cling on and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And so... 
uh, he, he always, you know, like kind of kept an eye out for us and, and friendly enough guy. But one day I was just kind of complaining because I'm like, God, I'm so, it's, I, I, there's so much dysfunction that happens. And, and you ever met somebody that thinks they're really doing a good thing when they're just making a disaster, right? And uh, so I'm kind of basing him on what he produces. <laughs> I'm not seeing a lot of value. I'm not seeing the Rolex thing going here. So uh, I'm complaining. I'm like, God, like, can't you fix this? Can you not? Like, this guy needs to go. He's driving me nuts. He's driving me nuts. And God goes, you want me to move him? Hey, now we're going somewhere. And he goes, well, well maybe, because they'd been there for quite a considerable amount of time. And, uh, um, you know, like, even though his addiction, nothing had ever gone missing from our house, and he really kept a pretty good eye on the place. And God goes, well, I'll move him, and maybe I'll bring you somebody that doesn't have my character of loyalty. Maybe you'd rather have another addict who steals from you. <laughs> oh, well, things look a little different now. <laughs> he goes, you've got to see the character in him that I put there that he's exerting on you, you're receiving something good from me through him because, because he can't sleep at night, he keeps an eye on your plate. And because he's up at all hours of the night, a lot of other nonsense that might happen out in front of your house goes someplace else because there's just too much racket coming out of that tent. <laughs> God goes, I'm looking out for you. Would you, would you rather? And, and it was just kind of an eye-opener because I began to see him differently. I didn't agree with what he did. I wanted him to get better. I, I still didn't like it when he would stop me and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and tell me all these stories. But I recognized, and I, and I wish I would have expressed better to him. Thank you for your loyalty. Thank you for looking out for my family. Thank you for looking out for my problems. I wish I would have done. Eventually, he left. He had to. He got himself in a, in a fix. But it was so funny. Oh, a couple months ago, Cassandra and I were in Kalispell, and something came up about this guy and his wife. We were just in the van, and we walk into Target, and there they are. <laughs> I went, and of course, they stopped and just talked to us like it had been just yesterday. Since they seen us talk and talk, and they're out in other place, and the stories were still going. And, and it, it, lo it looked like maybe he had slowed down on his consumption habit. I'm not sure. But value, it just helped me to understand, that, God, I need to look for your value in people, especially the ones that really bug me. Because there is value, and I'll guarantee you that I'll probably have a chance to speak to that. And so what comes out of my mouth May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. When we recognize God's value in each person, his handprints on their life, and when we vocalize or express the value in a real meaningful way, we are creating healthy community in our community, and we are creating a greater capacity for God. Titus 3, 4, and 5, but when the kindness of our God and Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of our goodness or the things that we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regenerating and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 is a strong reminder that God does not value us based on our stellar performance. God redeems his children so they can experience the great value he has given them in his plan. That's the greatest thing I look forward to. I go, God, would you help me to experience the reason you created me? You didn't create me out of need. A lot of times you ever heard somebody say, well, I wonder if God needs me. No, he doesn't. God does not know what need is. He's God. But he is a creator, and he created with purpose. So when he created you, it wasn't for need. It was for on purpose. It was on purpose. It's like, man, I put some things in you that nobody else has. You have attributes and facets of me that nobody else has. You might need to know that today. Like, 
You have value not based on what you do, but what he put in you. And all that really needs to happen to see that come out is just to have that willingness. God, sustain me with a willing heart. Help me to be willing to grow in what you created me for. Um, and that's a process of, of time and journey and relationship. Um, the value in you and in the person that you look at was present before redemption. Think about that so many times, especially within the church walls, we tend to value people who are doing well. Right? Oh man, I'm so excited about them. But you know what? They had value before God redeemed them because they were created in his image. That's why he sent his son, because they had value. And, and just that understanding of it, and, and valuing isn't ag agreeing. I understand there's a different. Valuing just says, I understand there's value. I don't agree. I don't agree with what you do. I don't agree with how you're doing it. But I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me to see through all that sin has distorted to give me x-ray vision to see who God is in you. And I'm going to walk towards that as he gives me opportunity. Um, God saw your value before you said yes to him. God, would you help us to see and affirm the value of each person, the value you see and the value you have given them. So, second core value, second core value. Um, and, and maybe you're going to find yourself in a situation this week where it's going to be on the backside and you're going to stop and go, hmm, God, would you help me to see the value because I know I'm going to have another encounter, right? Or maybe you already have somebody in mind. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you, God. Where's the value in this one? Come on. This is neither a Casio nor a Rolex. This is something else. Um, God, help me to see, help us to see. Father, we thank you for um, your love for us. God, you loved us so much. You saw so much value in us that you sent your son to die for our sin so that we would not have to be separated from your purpose and from your presence with us. We pray that as we leave this place, God, I know each and every one of us this week will have the opportunity to cultivate with prayer and to see the value in a person. God, help us to just have a willing heart. God, I, I will probably stumble and get it wrong. But I know that you are quick to forgive. And I know that you want to lead us. And what you require is willingness. So sustain us with a willing heart to change and to move, and to embrace what you are doing. God, help us to move towards the opportunities that we would have turned down for fear of failure. Your opportunities. Help us to move towards those. Not because of who we are, but because of who we follow. God, that you go before us. That you go before us. Would you go before us this week? God, I pray that you would encourage God, those who are discouraged. I pray that you would strengthen those who are weak. I pray that you would heal those who are sick. And I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand what you're doing. Holy Spirit, would you baptize us afresh today and tomorrow, next day, that we would be saturated with your presence and your power, your gifts. God, that we would shine as lights in a dark world. We thank you for all of these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.